If you're running traffic, especially paid traffic, you need to be willing to invest for a longer period of time to really see not just what's going to work on the micro, but what's going to work on the macro. What's your overarching conversion lift? How many more brand impressions are you getting? What's the impact to your organic search? Those types of things. It's no longer the turn it off, turn it on. The faucet of traffic is no longer a good strategy. Hello and welcome to the Perpetual Traffic Podcast. This is your host, Ralph Burns, and I'm now back virtually alongside my awesome co-host, Kasim Aslam. How you doing, buddy? I'm living the dream, Ralph, as always. Mm -hmm. Every day is just better than the last one, right? Is that sort of how it works in Kasim's world? Yeah, and if it's not, you lie to yourself and you kind of make it true until you end up in a bathtub full of gasoline lighting matches and you have to confront some <laughs> you have to confront some darkness but <laughs> until then seal the windows turn on the gas and the uh the stove no we don't go down that road that's that's a bad, <laughs> bad road no 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 things are good things are good i mean you know we've uh we've taken some punches here the last six months here as a, you know a, a social media and marketing digital marketing agency you as a google agency and I think one of the things that we talked about when we actually saw each other face to face in the Scooby Doo van at Traffic and Conversion Summit, which was a blast, by the way, um, hanging out with you, the conference, uh, eh, conference was just okay. You know, I don't know. Those guys at Digital Marketer, that was Clarion, they don't really know how to put together conferences, do they? <laughs> they don't know how to throw a party. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so unfortunately, Snoop Dogg got COVID. So uh, Magic Johnson filled in. Martha Stewart was there, and you were there, you know, rocking it on the stage there, which was pretty awesome to see. And I like um, that you, you said all of those things if, as if they were equal. You know, right. no big deal. Martha Stewart, Magic Johnson, Cossum. and Cossum. Yeah, that's right. Same and same. Uh, <laughs> well, you're you're right up there. You know, you're elevating your status. But I I think you're in a very unique position because you saw probably more of these talks than I did at TNC. I mean, the Tuesday of my talk, I was kind of mildly freaking out because I realized that uh, there was some kind of like Apple update and all of a sudden I <laughs> lost one of my presentations temporarily for two or three hours. So those two or three hours were in a bit of panic. Thankfully, I had it on a USB drive. Note to self or note to you if you're ever doing a presentation, back that sucker up in as many places as you possibly can. But the revisions I had made on Monday suddenly disappeared on Tuesday. But I did find it, um, you know, about an hour or so before I talked. So I did miss some of those talks on Tuesday. Uh, we both saw the the Ryan Dice opener, which I think is a is a great uh, one to even revisit and and you know talk to yet again because there's so much in there to deconstruct. But I think one of the things is from TNC is like traffic is not the same as it once was and what is really now and this was i believe the first episode now that i'm thinking about this this was the first episode of perpetual traffic which is the future of paid traffic hmm. now i would like to say today we should be talking about the future of traffic just in general because it doesn't necessarily need to be paid i think there's some uh even though you know organic reach on on facebook is pretty much dead we can Write that one is, off. Is there such entirely. a thing as organic I don't even Facebook know if reach? there is. Yeah, when we post on our page at Tier Eleven, we get like two people that see it. So I don't know. Either we really suck, or you know, organic really is dead. I'd like to think it's the, you know, the the latter, not the former. Um, but the point is, is like there's a lot of traffic that's out there still, but it's changed, and it's changed fundamentally in the last three to six months. Obviously, you from the Google side, us from like the the social media and conversion architecture which is after the click side as well but like let's talk about that here today and how that related back to maybe a lot of the talks that you saw let's take the dice guy out of it but you were in a lot of really really good talks you probably had one of the best rooms there was because i think you hand selected like, some of the better uh speakers that's why i didn't speak in your room i, I think now <laughs> i realize that putting two two together here clarence smarter i than just didn't want to be for. upstaged is all i was like i can't have ralph here yeah that's good uh so so what was your take on that i mean what does traffic look like according to you know some of the folks that were on stage there like what are your thoughts overall because i think a lot of people are you know they're pressing that panic button a bit in the last three to six months i think tnc was a good place to reset that get some new ideas, figure out some solutions and figure out what the next steps are. So what are your impressions of it at this point in time? 
Uh, you're going to have to protect me from myself, Ralph. So if I start to go off the rails, just we'll have like a safe word or something. All right. Um, I'll pineapples. say dice. There you go. Dice. <laughs> That's better. Uh, it's never coming back. And everybody needs to know that. Everybody's been super romantic about the way they made their money for a really long time. And I hear it from all angles. You know, oh, I, you know, we this great, great performing Facebook uh, campaign. How do we how do we fix it to where it did what it was doing? Or, you know, our, our YouTube account or, or Google or whatever, our SEO, like all the things have changed permanently and we have to move forward. And so for those of you that are trying to resuscitate whatever it is that you had, it's dead. It's not dying, it's dead. And there are elements of it that you could, you know, if you want to disembowel and dismember this, you know, this, this carcass that you're looking at and bring forward some of, of what was working, I think that there, there could be some wisdom there. But uh, you're going to just beat your head against the wall if, if you try to completely replicate what you had. And I know you said that we're not going to bring up the, the, the Ryan thing, but I, I, I want to just briefly to, to set the stage for the discussion because I think Ryan said the most brilliant thing that could be said. And if you don't mind me saying, Ralph, this is going to sound mildly arrogant. This has, been, this has been a mantra of mine for a really long time. Ryan said that it's time to focus on the principles of marketing. I wrote a book in 2017 called The Seven Critical Principles of Effective Digital Marketing. And, and I, I mirrored it because I'm obsessed with them off of Stephen Covey's Seven Habits. And Covey talks a lot about principles as a paradigm, um, you know, the character ethic versus the personality ethic, et cetera. And the whole quick fix, hack, tips, tricks, BS, like it's, it's done. And we need to now focus on making marketing a, a real endeavor. You know, it's no longer like a, a back alley, just pull rabbits out of your hat. Anybody can learn over the weekend thing. It's, it's something that needs to be invested in and, and, and nurtured and cultivated. And it always has been that way, but, but the hackers were, they were really able to make some headway and their day is done. And, and, and that maybe is one of the most annoying soapboxes I want to jump on real quick and then I'll shut up. Man, I, I hate the gurus. I hate them. Yeah. I, I, I hate them. And I, I think they should all be stripped naked, tarred, feathered, and paraded through every major city to apologize and atone for their sins. Because if somebody's selling education and they don't actually do this for a living, that's what I love about digital marketer. That's, you know, one of their, their, their slogans for a long time is we actually do this stuff. Mm. Um, and if you're listening to this, stop, stop buying the courses, stop it. You know, I mean, if there's somebody out there that actually does it, go learn from them for sure. But some of these freaking jokers, man, and I won't say any names because it's, you know, such an incestuous industry. Um, and I don't want to get in trouble, but it's, right. it's easy to spot. You know what I mean? Like it's easy to spot the people that don't really do it. And, and, and 90% of their courses aren't, aren't actually, they're not consumed anyway. So it's easy for them to get away with it because they've just got a lot of flashbang, whiz bang, whatever's right. And, uh, all of that's done. Like, like we need to focus on marketing. Like it's like, it's any other, you know, like it's accounting, you know, like it's the, a type of thing that you actually have to follow the rules for and invest in over the long term. You need to know gap. <laughs> you need to know gap. That's exactly right. Whatever the analogy is for marketing. Generally accepted accounting principles. Accounting practices. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, I've got some bad news for you, by the way. Hmm. You have become a guru. <laughs> As I've, I've, you know, had to accept my self-loathing long ago, so it's mm -hmm. fine. It, it factors perfectly. Now, coming from someone who denies being a guru, which I, I hate the term too because it's such bull crap because it denotes exactly what you're talking about in a lot of ways. And we've seen a lot of charlatans out there for nobody knows what a charlatan is. It's basically, it's a faker and there's a lot of them. And that was funny because the day that I was mildly freaking out about my TNC presentation, my VP of marketing was watching a lot of other talks, not to name any names, but there was some people that were up there that were just blathering on about like generalized marketing principles. Like you have to put the right message in front of the right person. Like, I get that, but like, tell me how. Go <laughs> tactical, get a little deeper. Don't show me a Shopify tactic from 2017. It's 2021 for Christ's sake. You know, I mean, I was showing some screenshots from April of this year and I felt bad about that in my <laughs> presentation, even though, you know, we, we talked about iOS and, you know, talked about it head on and all the stuff that we're dealing with right now. So the point is, is like, how do you, how, you know, as a 
guru, sorry, you know, as someone who is a, uh, a subject matter expert, let's try that instead of guru. How does someone differentiate between a, a guru and somebody who actually knows what they're doing? How do you not get duped? And I know there's a lot of folks that listen to the show that are still kind of new at this. I mean, we've got some more advanced people and I think it's important to go back to the basics no matter what. You know, um, but the point is, is like, how do you find who is the right ones and who isn't? What would be your filter? I'm just going to brainstorm here with you a little bit. Maybe we can build the filter together. Um, the easy red flags are linguistic in construct. It's it's semantics. So like, you know, the the, the dollar a day YouTube strategy. That type of thing should be immediately be a red flag, because if somebody's making any any money running ads for a buck a day, then you have to question why it is that they're selling education. Now, interestingly, th there are some really good lead-ins with things like that. So don't discard them, you know, in its entirety. You know, Dennis, you actually, now that I think about it, has a dollar a day Facebook strategy. I really like Dennis. I think he's a super sharp guy. Dennis has a phenomenal agency. He knows what he's doing. So, you know, don't discard well, somebody. He entirely. does it. He does so, it. There's that's, the qualifier. That's, that's the key. Okay. So I wouldn't discard them out of hand because they have clickbait titles, but I would, I would put your, I would put your wall up. But what you just said, Ralph, I think is the most important thing. Do they perform this function, this task on a regular basis? You know, them or someone on their team? Is there, is there an agency or an executor or, you know, are they an in-house marketer for something that would allow them to be a believable? Ray Dalio talks about this a lot in his book, Principles, relying on the believable party because everybody's got an opinion. You know, opinions are like rectums, as they say. Um, Everyone's got them. Everybody's got them, and they all stink. Um, who's the believable party in the room? And, and, and what is it about them that makes them believable? It's not – and, you know, man, here's what sucks about listening to thought leaders. And I, I fall into this category, by the way. It's not the smartest guy that gets the gig. It's, it's, it's the showman. Mm -hmm. Right. It's like the best orator, whoever puts the sure. best spin on it or who can say it. The, so really the smartest guys and gals – are probably like deep, dark, cave-dwelling, nocturnal, over-caffeinated, don't want to talk to people and don't actually want to be on stage. The people you get to hear from are the egocentric, you know, I have the sad, pathetic personality trait that just loves attention. And so that's, that's why I'm here. And that's why you have to contend with the information that I'm offering you. Mm -hmm. I do have the benefit of saying I have the number one Google Ads agency on the planet. And we've got 160 clients and 50 employees. And we've been doing this for 15 years or however long it's been. And, and, and that pedigree, I think, uh, at least allows me some level of believability. But there are people out there that are more believable than I am. I'll, I'll name one, actually. Here's a competitor of mine who's, who's smarter than I am, uh, Ed Leak. He's out of the UK, super sharp mm -hmm. guy. He sells education. He actually does it on a, on a regular basis. Now, he's not taking on any more clients, which is why I'm comfortable name dropping him. Um, well but, done. But go, go find people that do it. And most of those people don't sell education. So you have yeah. to find the people. It's that apex. It's like they actually do this, and they're willing to tell you what it is that they do that's the education to go in and, and consume. Mm -hmm. Couldn't agree more. I think, uh, you know, there is a component of, I always sort of think to myself, like, who's the competition for what we do? And it's some guy in his basement somewhere, it, you know, who doesn't get out, doesn't have a, a podcast and just is figuring this crap out, like in a crazy like algorithmic way and he's a mad scientist and you'd never see him on a stage and he'd probably never actually come out with an info product, but like, that's the competition, <laughs> that's the competition mm -hmm. because we're basically competing against in a lot of ways, um, embedded biases as to how things have always been done. And the reason I say that is that it was actually a subject of one of our calls yesterday, one of our group calls where we do like breakout sessions and zoom, which is really cool. I don't know if you've ever really done that, but you can break people out into sessions into smaller groups. Like we've got a big zoom call. Like we've got like 40, 50 people on the thing. Uh, and then, you know, we break out into these smaller groups and we talk about it and it was all about biases. And it was led by our, our VP of innovation who was on the show back on episode 324, who's somebody who actually is doing this stuff, by the way, he's not like just a figurehead. Go back and listen to that episode for sure. Um, the point was, is like, I think we're battling against that all the time too, because there's things that are happening, like something that worked in 2017 doesn't work anymore. Although, mm. you know, like we came out with all kinds of 
whiz bang tactics and strategies and and names of stuff like we came out with the Michigan method. We came out with the e-com ad amplifier and all these things that really did work well. Now, do we use parts of those and still what we do today? Yes, we absolutely do. But is that is the next tactic? Nobody has the solution for iOS 14 and 15. OK, I'm going to tell you that right now, unless they're actually going back through and like hacking the system and they've got some crazy ass way of doing it. I'd like to know exactly what it is. And if you have that solution, email me directly at ralph at tier 11.com and I will be sure to vet it. But the point is, is like, now what are you going to do about it? Unless you have, have that hack, a, by the way, yeah, <laughs> supposedly just, just so you know, just word. a soundbite for you, Ralph, I've have a horrible idea, but keep going. I just want it's to true. plant the seed. We, we, we have to make sure that is Facebook compliant. <laughs> um, that's, the, that's the killer thing. If Facebook is listening, we're not doing Gossam's hack as of right now. So anyway, so here we are talking about no hacks and you bring up a hack. Oh my God. You're such a guru all of a sudden. Such a guru. Look I know. Such a hypocrite. Yeah. yeah total hypocrite. So we're battling against biases of things that maybe we've done in the past and didn't work. And now maybe they should be tested again or relooked at. And everyone has biases. Everyone has like certain ways of looking at things. If you're saying, Oh, I'm the most unbiased person in the world. Well, that means that you are biased towards the fact that you're unbiased. You know what I mean? Like we all carry biases as, as humans. So how do you get around all these solutions and how do you look at things a little bit differently? And I think, you know, the gurus just have like a one size fits all, like this is what you're going to need to do in order for this to work. Well, you know, the $1 a day Facebook strategy that Dennis Hugh advocates is a good one, but it's one of many things. It's like well, a way he to builds test. on it. He uses right, he that to kind of attract it. your attention and then builds on it, right? Sure. It's not the be all end all. It's not how he runs all his campaigns. And I'm, I'm fairly certain that is the case. So, uh, so how do you actually, how do you break through that and and how do you break through your own biases to be able to innovate and come up with solutions to the problems to ultimately move this whole thing forward? Because this is, after all, we're talking about the future of traffic here. Oh, I, I, I can't answer your question properly because I think I'm the worst at it. I'm, I distrust Google so much. When Google rolls out, like they actually just had, a, they had an article they posted today at the time of this recording, it's September 23rd as I'm looking at this. And on September 23rd, 2021, Google posts an article that says matching the most relevant keyword to every search. And in the article, they go on to say that uh, they're using machine learning in order to improve the uh, uh, understanding of search intent and predictability and how keywords match. That's an exact quote. And they want you to use broad match with smart bidding, which is something we call broad automation. Now I use broad match and smart bidding and it works, uh, it works more often than I would have expected. But I read this article, I roll my eyes, and I'm instantly about to slack my team and say, oh, look at the BS that Google rolled out. Can you believe that people fall for this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, when really the scientific method would dictate that I need to test this first before instantly indicting it conceptually. Correct. But I've been bit so many times, it's hard to do. You know, I mean, humans are, we're, 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 we're pattern recognition machines, even when pattern is, patterns aren't necessarily there. And I think, I mean, that's, that's, you know, a couple hundred thousand years of evolution at play. Sure. Like you had to start to try to identify patterns because if you didn't, you died. And, and now we need to go against the grain a little bit and get a little more scientific in our thinking. And man, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to undo the Pavlov's dog response that I have every time somebody gives me, you know, a bad piece of advice that came directly from Google. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's the, and I hate to get too esoteric on a show that's pretty tactical overall, but I do think it's important because the tactics come from new ways of thinking. Like the, the reason why we come on here and we say, oh, this is working really well is because we've actually, you know, pushed aside our previous biases and done something different than what we've always done and came mm -hmm. up with an innovation, which means there's gonna be a lot of failure along the way. Great example yesterday, you know, not to call out my team, but I'm going to, is that our Facebook partner manager, and you know, we have a call with her every two weeks, and she mentioned lead ads. She's like, yeah, well, lead ads are, are great, and you know, a lot of agencies that are in your space are starting to rethink them and utilizing them for front end lead gen because you're staying within this, the, the, the environment, you're staying within the app in this it's case, populated, it's pre populated, you know, all these other, there's all these benefits to it. And my team immediately poo pooed it. 
And so uh, we don't do that. No, no, no. That's just total crap. And I said, well, wait a second here. Like those are preconceived notions and those are biases and things that maybe didn't work in the past, but now we should at least reconsider it. Cause what I've found within Facebook, especially is that they come out with something. It's kind of crappy. It sort of kind of works and then it gets better over time. So if you come out and try it when it's kind of crappy, like I remember when power editor, I'm really dating myself now, power <laughs> editor came out, everyone hated it. And, but then slowly, but surely it got better and better and better and better. And then when they took it away, I don't remember exactly when it was like a year and a half, two years ago, people were like, Oh my God, I can't believe they're getting rid of power editor. Like it became an integrated part of your life. Mm. And I remember how I did it. It was by not me dictating to them. I said, you know, I got together our smartest media buyers. I said, I, got, I want you guys to try this and tell me what you think and just set everything aside and give me feedback on it. And then we're going to retest it in two months, three months, six months. And that became a part of everything that we did. So the point is, is that those biases were embedded on some new technology that we didn't want to use. And then it ended up like absolutely scaling our business 10 X because we could now manage so much more. It was this tiny little innovation that everyone on my team was like, oh, there's no way I'd ever do that. It's like, you're yeah. fighting against that. So lead ads yesterday was yet another one, you know? Oh, well, you know, it takes too long. Like the, you know, the integration with, um, you know, the sync doesn't work quite as well. You know, the zap, I'm constantly dealing with zaps all the time. And, you know, the email addresses suck and all this other sort of stuff. And my partner manager was like, I don't know, you need to do that. Or you can keep dealing with iOS and as a potential alternate. And then I said, well, isn't one of our largest customers using lead ads? Wow. And it's true. They actually were and still are. And they realized that maybe 20, 30% of those leads are crap because it's an old email address or something like that. But the leads are so cheap. And the integration is good enough, even though it does take some work, that it's helping them scale and grow. So I look at just an example like that. I'm not saying that tier 11 isn't on the cutting edge. We absolutely are. But my point is, is like we have our own biases as well. Because I mean, like you say, we are, we are creatures of habit, but we're also creatures of exclusion. It's like, I need to focus on these things. Like if I focus on too many things, I'm too distracted. I do need to actually focus on... And if I bring all these other things in, like it's going to be hard and it's going to take more time. And then I'm going to be wasting time. And then it's going to be uncomfortable because I'm not really going to be knowing what I'm doing, but that's innovation. Hmm. And that's, that's the kind of stuff that we really need to look at. Like your, you know, your hot jar zappier guru trick, you know, like, can I, can I air that out Ralph a little yeah. bit or is it dangerous to do? Uh, go for it. All right. So just anybody listening, first of all, we don't know if this is compliant or if you're going to get slapped on the wrist. We're honestly, <laughs> no if, idea. It, if it works at scale. So my, my agency doesn't run Facebook need, ads. Like, you know what we need? We need a lawyer uh, to come on here. Yeah. What you will hear right now from Qasem Aslam is not necessarily endorsed <laughs> by Major League Baseball or by pe Perpetual Traffic. Go ahead. This is not <laughs> Perpetual Traffic approved. So um, we've done this for ourselves. We haven't done it at scale at all, but uh, we fixed the the ios blind spot to some degree and here's how we did it and i'm going to do my best to try to explain it in the least technical terms possible but it is a, it is a technical fix when somebody clicks on a facebook ad facebook facebook through the url delivers something called the facebook click id which is the unique identifier used to identify that click on that ad at that time by that person um the facebook click id is how facebook knows what took place when where etc now when they click on the ad and go to the site, the funnel, the page, whatever, that's where Facebook's visibility stops because of the iOS update. So Apple basically said, we're going to stop giving this information. So now Facebook can't see they're blind. And in order to fix it, Facebook rolled out something called the Facebook conversion API, where when somebody converts, so they bought, they scheduled, they fill out your form, whatever. Now you have all their information. In addition to their information, you have the Facebook click ID and you can use the Facebook conversion API to port that information back into Facebook and say, Hey, Ralph clicked on my ad, went to my site, took this action. And so you append that, that action basically to the conversion event that's appropriate inside of Facebook. And you only get eight, as you know, mm -hmm. and 
and now you've you've brought in Facebook's visibility. Here's the problem. It, if you're only doing it on a completed conversion, you, you, Facebook still can't see the entirety of the funnel. They can see the tippity top, the ad they saw, and they can see the very bottom, the thing that they did. But from the top to the bottom is this entire middle area, which is maybe the most important area. It's why Facebook has had difficulty optimizing campaigns up until this point. So here's what we did. We used Hotjar, and you don't have to use Hotjar, by the way. You can custom code this, JavaScript, whatever, if you're smarter than I am. I'm an idiot. I needed Hotjar. We used Hotjar, which is a screen recording software, to identify predictive indicators of intent. These are things like time on site, number of pages viewed. Uh, maybe they went to my pricing page. You know, they watch X amount of a video, et cetera. Hotjar does a really good job at giving you um, ideas as to who an engaged user is. The other thing Hotjar does is it captures the entirety of the URL. So here's where it gets ninja. And, and forgive me if, if I lose people here for just a second. We use Zapier, which is triggered by whatever event we define. So the predictive indicator of intent. So the person hasn't converted yet. But it's like, hey, they, they were on, they, they viewed three pages and they went to my plans and pricing page. I think this is an engaged user. So using Zapier, we pull the Facebook click ID and push it back into Facebook and append it to a conversion action that we create specifically for that predictive indicator of intent, which would be different for every campaign. And maybe you have multiple. And what that did is it gave Facebook the ability to begin optimizing our campaigns. We're basically lying to Facebook. We're giving it a false positive, but we're giving it a false positive that is only 50% false, right? Because the, the person is obviously engaged to, to a degree that's adequate for our purposes. Here's where the rubber met the road. We had a $90 cost per lead pre-fix. We have a $30 cost per lead now. So we were able to increase the efficacy to a point to where we are more or less where we were pre-iOS. Now, will this work at scale? I have no idea. And I'm not going to test it. <laughs> well, what we was don't the do conversion enough event? Was it, it was a lead, correct? You mean the ultimate cost per lead? No, the, the 90, your $90 CPA. What conversion event was that? It's a lead. Yeah, it's somebody it's giving us their contact information, and, and now they want an action plan for Google Ads. Okay, so that lead was showing up in the CRM of, in this case, a customer or you or regardless of that, whether it showed up in Facebook, it was showing up in your CRM. That's just showing up in our CRM, correct. Okay, so you were running Facebook ads for this, that you had Google ads, you had multi-platform, like what was the... What this was particular uh, campaign is going after an ultra-targeted segment of... of uh, people, businesses in a specific niche that we're trying to, uh, and I'm not going to say the niche because I don't want to tip my hat to my competitors, but um, we feel there's a pretty significant uh, area of opportunity, uh, call it, you know, blue ocean. And so it's, it's, it's targeted enough from the outset to be quality, which is helpful, obviously, because we know, we know what our, what our avatar is. Mm -hmm. All things being equal, if you looked at a seven day look back pre, you know, guru hacky click thingy here and i am going to check with facebook on this by the way whether or not it is <laughs> compliant um was all things being equal same amount of traffic no scaling same spend were you seeing the same amount of leads coming into your crm after you did this with hotjar and before you did this with hotjar no it's still a little less pre iOS update, the campaign was performing better. Mm -hmm. iOS update killed it. Okay. Host so it was the optimization engine that was really hurting this individual campaign. Correct. And But okay. when we rolled out the hot jar fix, it didn't bring it back to pre iOS numbers, but it got a lot closer. Okay. And As I mean, remember, we're spending less than three grand a month on this. So it's a, okay. it's a micro campaign, teeny tiny. Still, it's data. Right. My point is, is like, how much were you actually seeing prior to this change and through this implementation with Hotjar and Zapier? Uh, or, and it, that's probably that's significant, but it's not, it's not game changing. Like, let's say you got a hundred leads before it, and all of a sudden you got 120 leads after, but you could still see both. Now, maybe 30 were showing up before in Facebook ads manager mm -hmm. and now only, and now, you know, maybe 90 are, 
you know, in the other, you know, post hot jar Zapier. I'm trying to like name this thing something that's the hot jar zap thingy. Um, but you were seeing hot similar hot zap. There you go. That's good. Uh, but you were seeing similar leads inside your CRM, but slightly more after you implemented this solution. But the big thing is that you saw them appearing in ads manager, and that's obviously feeding more information, more data to the algorithm to allow it to do its job better. Correct. Gotcha. Correct. Now, the, the criticism I've received, and this actually came from a YouTube commenter. I have a, a video tutorial on my YouTube channel of this strategy. Uh, somebody came out and said, there's no way that this is ATT compliant. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not. But if it's not, it means that if you attempt to do this at scale, I would anticipate Facebook probably trying to curtail it. My response to that, though, is it is technically first party data. Your, your, the URL, your UTM parameters, the Facebook click ID, the activity that somebody's taking on your website, all of that is first party data. We are allowed to use first party data in its entirety as long as you are properly disclosing that in your privacy policy and, and, and data policies. Mm -hmm. That first party data should be accessible to you from a utilization standpoint. Now, whether or not Facebook allows its Facebook conversion API to take advantage of it the way that I want it to is another story. Also, and, and just to you know, put guardrails on the recommendations I'm making to people, there's really no definitive proof that the improvement in the campaign was from this fix. It could have been a lot of things. It could have been a change in the cyclical market that I'm not aware of. It could have been a big competitor sure. dropping out and just stopping spending. So there are other factors at play. There's no perfect split test here, mm -hmm. but it is really compelling. From an academic standpoint, it's something I'm proud of. And I think is you know worth, if, if you've got, I know I told everybody that everything's dead and don't try to bring it back. But if you have a previously performing Facebook campaign and you want to see whether or not this helps to you know, buttress what it is that you have from, from a data perspective and assist Facebook with the optimization. It's, it's worth an attempt. Mm. The interesting part of this is the conversions were not, um, they were still appearing in the CRM. The real thing is that it's the visibility inside ads manager was greatly enhanced, which then potentially can enhance the optimization of the algorithm Correct. and the, the ad spend in which you're doing it. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's the faux conversion that you're offering Facebook that gives it a sense as to what somebody might do in the future. Mm -hmm. But the leads were still showing up in the CRM, but they were turning off the campaign as a result of this because they're like, well, we're, are, were they, it doesn't seem like there was any degradation in leads showing up in the CRM. Well, no, post iOS, and the benefit I have here is it's, it's in a silo. There's no other traffic channel that we were using for this particular funnel. Mm -hmm. And so it was, it was Facebook in its entirety. So I can tell you from, you know, direct conversion to a conversion lift standpoint, if a lead landed for this particular prospect, it came from this Facebook campaign okay. pre iOS, it was functioning pretty well. I think we're like a $20 CPL, which isn't great for a top of the funnel lead, you know, inside of Facebook, there are people that get like three to five, but we have an ultra specific niche. So $20 CPL, uh, post iOS, it jumps up to 90. Mm -hmm. I add my little hot zap fix and it drops down to 30. Mm -hmm. So you know, pretty significant improvement metrics uh, across the board. How many conversions on average per day were you getting pre hot zap and post hot zap? Oh gosh, that's a really good question. I don't, I mean, I could, I could probably intuit, you know, we were spending a hundred bucks a day basically. And so I think we're getting like three to five, three to from one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're well under that 50 conversions per ad set per week, which is still something that we do rely upon for, you know, full optimization. You know, even with CBO, ABO, we're getting a little bit weedy here for some of the people that we started very high level. And now we're getting very, very tactical. So, so the show is kind of a combination of the two. So, but anyway, here is a strategy point with, you know, going back to our original premise here is that you can't do the same things that you've always done and you do need to innovate. And you know, here we are as a, as an ad agency, like we're looking at stuff very differently. But is this a potential solution? I don't know as of yet. I mean, we have to make sure that it's compliant with Facebook and everything else. But I know the team has been working on it and testing it. The question is, is what the results are. Because it's relatively a new finding. I think this came out and you discovered it in August, I believe, not too long ago. After yeah, the last, uh, the last war room. Yeah, last war room. So it's still relatively new. But the point is, is like, even as you know, somebody who knows that innovation is good, 
And it means that you have to set aside your biases. The immediate bias was like, ah, nah, that can't possibly work. Ah, you know, zaps are too expensive. Well, maybe not. You know, if you're doing this at scale, you know, I don't know how many conversions we get per day, probably 10,000 conversions a day is my guess, you know, so that scale for sure. So is something like this a potential solution? I don't know whether it is or it isn't. The point is, is that you innovate and you think of things and you're open to ideas today more so than you ever have been uh, in order to really survive in the traffic world as it currently exists. And mm. that is a very big takeaway, I think, for everyone here. Like Google's, you know, I don't know if Google has the, well, I guess Google sort of does have the equivalent of this. It's like another Offline thing. conversion is, tracking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But Google doesn't give you as many conversion actions to optimize against. Facebook is allowing you eight conversion actions instead of a campaign. Google kind of allows you two, one that you can consider to be a transitional conversion, one that you'd consider to be, you know, the primary conversion. You can have more conversion actions in that, but not tethered to a single campaign. So it, it doesn't let you, Google does this automatically behind the scenes, algorithmically, I think, but it doesn't let you fake the funk, um, mm -hmm. to the same degree. Right. Yeah. I think, you know, this is an example of potentially, you know, an individual tactic or a hack, even though they're sort of, we're, we're, this is the we're, same guru bullshit that we told people not we to are contradicting to ourselves yeah. here. So let's get back to aside from that individual hack. And like I said, you know, everything that we do here, we're transparent. Like if we're finding something that works. We're going to tell you the perpetual traffic listener, because that's just how we roll people because we actually do do this stuff every single day. So that's a good indication, even though neither one of us are gurus. Um, we just have to be subject matter experts and, and understand this. But going back even further, like back to even Dice's talk, it's like going back to the basics, the principles, the most important things about marketing. Um, and one of the things I think that was, you know, definitely go back and listen in on, on episode 324 when I, we interview our VP of strategy and innovation. He's basically a creative guy who innovated a new way of thinking about how we can mass produce both uh, research as well as avatar creation to talk really deeply to our avatar, which has nothing to do with some hot zap whiz bang tactic. It has to do with exactly what Dice talked about, which is Go back and read Eugene Schwartz, um, mm. the best advertising book for me on the planet, which is Breakthrough Advertising. Head on over to BreakthroughAdvertising.com. Get it from um, you know a good friend of mine, but uh, no affiliate link, by the way. It's just the best place to find it. But it was 1952, I think it was written. And all that stuff is so true today. I still quote it today. And it doesn't come back to any tactic. It's about really speaking to the known desires or pain points, like really understanding and feeling who that avatar is in your cold traffic and your front end ad. Like if you cannot crack cold traffic, you're screwed right now. If you're writing bland, flavorless, you know, copy with static images that don't speak to the known and desires or pain points of your desired market, or at least are interesting and captivating in one way, shape or form, or you're not utilizing video to tell the story and you're not doing all these sort of deep and profound things. We should do an entire uh, episode just on breakthrough advertising unto itself, but be that as it may, like that is one of those things you can go back to. It's like, oh, I already know how to write copy. It's like, that's bullshit. Like I read mm. breakthrough advertising every year. <laughs> you know, It's not like I haven't been doing this for a while. It's like, you know, just set your ego aside and your biases aside that you either know it all or you have to go back to things that are really really different one of the best books we talked about this on a youtube live we did another great one this guy is an absolute like operator he does this stuff it was 100 million dollar offers by alex hermosi hmm. like, it's such a great book because first off he does this stuff He's the guy who launched Jim Launch. We should get him on the podcast at one point in time. Maybe if we like kiss up to him enough on this show, he'll find out and he'll just find us. He'll just, he'll just find us. But no, it's a great book because what he does is he goes back to like the basic principles of if your offer stinks, like everything else stinks. And that really means that you have to create great offers. And how do you do it? 
tactically. And we can go through this in another episode, but another great book. And we'll leave all the resources in the show notes for you folks uh, 100% between those two books right there. Like you could just go and go to town and you're immediately, you would get a lift in your conversions to your cold traffic, whether you're lead gen, whether you're trying to sell something online, whether you're a service, you know, getting high end leads, like the one that we just talked about here, like those are just game changers. And it's going back to the basics and a lot of the stuff that Dice talked about opening up TNC. Yeah. Yeah. There's a masterclass in there and, and it's, it's a less is more thing too. You don't have to listen to every freaking guru. Listen to the ones that have landed at the top. They're there for a reason. There's, I'm going to, I'm going to butcher this Ralph, but there's a, um, a study done on the longevity of information that says if something has been around for a longer period of time, it's twice as likely to be around for that same period of time looking forward. So, so like Marcus Aurelius's you know, book is, is exponentially more valuable than something that was written 48 hours ago because it's, it's been vetted and it's more likely to you know, basically double in tenure. Do you know what I'm talking about? Does that mm. sound familiar to you at all? Yeah, I don't know what the principle is but it's you know right there i mean i i think you know like the eugene schwartz book i mean he borrowed from all the great advertising people before him but i mean they still like those principles have withstood the test of time even though changed. he uses you know he uses uh you know old school analogies for the stuff that we do today but it, it's like it's still which kind of makes it quaint and interesting and you're like oh you're man. advertising cigarettes to 12 year olds this is what you <laughs> He does with a cigarette, the example in there. Yeah. I forget the, the weight loss. It's, oh man, it's such a funny term. It's like lightening or something like that. Like lessening, shortening. It's, it's like the, and then you finally feel like, what is he talking about? And then you're like, oh, this is a weight loss niche. <laughs> there, there's a whole, there's a whole industry built around just taking stuff like that and updating it. Yeah. I can't count how many people like put out a, a course or a book or whatever. And I'm like, you ripped this right out of Dan Kennedy. <laughs> Dan Kennedy is like the most played, you know what I mean? He's a super oh. sharp guy. And I mean, he ripped off a lot of stuff too, but sure. um, yeah, if you want to be a guru, just go read an old book and update it. Nobody's ever going to know because nobody goes and, and revisits the old books. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, what else? What else did you pull from uh, TNC, sort of the post TNC eval here? Did you hear anything else uh, on stage from any of the folks that were in your room that that would help the listeners here uh, navigate the uh, the future here and the future of, of traffic? A couple of things. So I've got some notes here in front of me. Um, the first one we've already touched on, I'll, I'll breeze over it. But, but I don't want me breezing to be an indication that it's not important. It is. I just don't want to dwell on it. Uh, it's the importance of first party data. Um, and that came from the, the we had a, a meeting on main stage on, you know, the big takeaways from the elite program and first party data is so critical. And if you're not capturing first party data, you're at a massive disadvantage. Um, and, and I'll leave that topic alone because it's not sexy and it's, it's not fun, but get a CRM, capture first party data. It's not hard. It's just tedious. Uh, the one that I really do want to dwell on a little bit is, is ROI, not ROAS. Uh, and, and because, you know, we're a paid ad agency and my clients want to know what their ROAS is or what their cost per acquisition is. And we'll report on those. We'll continue to, I can't tell a client, you need to look at your overarching ROI, but what I can do is tell our listeners and, you know, anybody who's in business, that's the only metric that you can really rely on long-term to prove the efficacy of your advertising, because we are all now flying blind and that's only going to get worse. So you're going to have to look at things like conversion lift and, and, you know, what kind of impact advertising is having on your, your profitability outside of what you can directly attribute. And if you're not willing to look at ROI, you're actually putting yourself at a, at a, at a big disadvantage when compared to a competitor that is willing to look at that because what, they what do you mean by in, that ROAS sorry. versus ROI just deconstruct that for. Yeah. Time. So ROAS and I, and I'm using ROAS incorrectly here, by the way, it's just the easiest, it's the easiest comparable, you know, acronym, but basically ROAS being return on ad spend. Um, if you put in, a thousand dollars, you know, a day into campaign A. How much money is campaign A producing in this period of time? The reason that's a flawed model. It's actually a multivariant problem. First is campaign A might be the client acquisition campaign, but it's not the campaign that closes the client. So now campaign A is bringing the visibility to your products, not necessarily having the, the, the correct conversion attribution. And so you turn campaign A off thinking, oh, campaign A makes me no money, only to find out 6, 9, 12, 18 months later, oh, that's what was getting people here in the first place. And even though it's campaign D that's closing them, campaign D is no longer being fed. So ROAS 
uh, uh, obsession over ROAS is already dangerous, but but now broaden your view there a little bit because you want ROAS on your Google uh, campaigns, on your Facebook campaigns, on your Snapchat, your TikTok, your organic, your email, your traditional, whatever. The the problem with that is 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 you're you know people are seeing you across all of these different channels. Statistic takes thirty one impressions before somebody's ready to convert. They've they've seen you everywhere, um, so to speak. You know, and 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 for you to say, well, what's my exact ROAS on? It, it, you know, it's it's the old television, radio, newspaper marketing mantra. You can't say this commercial at this time got me this return because you didn't know you were flying blind. So you have to say, all right, I spent a hundred grand this month on on ads. And uh, what was my profitability? What's my overall ROI, return on investment? Is that, it's a dangerous thing for me to say because it takes the responsibility off of my shoulders. It makes me, it's an abdication of responsibility from, from an agency perspective. So I realize it's in my best interest to say those words because now I get to say like, oh, well, we don't know how this campaign's performing. Just check your ROI. So I'm not telling people not to try to drill into it. You should, but you should also be receptive to the idea that there's profitability coming from pockets of traffic that you can't necessarily directly attribute and pay attention to. And the best way to test this, by the way, is turn it off, turn it off. And then look at the, look at the appropriate timeline based off of how long your sales cycle is. And you'll notice, wow, when I turned that off for whatever reason, I can, you know, my, my sales dipped 90 days later, there must have been something there. Um, now, not everybody has the luxury of being able to do that, but that's why you want to start focusing on ROI and not obsessing over ROAS to such a degree. Funny story. Um, maybe not so funny. It's actually kind of sad, but um, <laughs> it's a story directly related to what you're talking about. So we run Google ads, we run search, we run branded search, non-branded search campaigns. We do some YouTube, but primarily we go after that market, but we also do do a fair amount of Facebook. So what we really do is top of funnel stuff on Facebook because we can't really expect people to just kind of come in and you know, hire us sight unseen. Like they need to know that we're actually good and we do what we say and, and know, like, and trust and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, this podcast is one way to do it, I suppose, but then we do it through Facebook video ads, through what we refer to as level zero traffic. And it's a really great way of, you know, accumulating lots of audiences on platform, by the way, which you can then obviously retarget. And we have a retargeting campaign on Facebook, but what we for some reason, I'm not exactly sure why it might have been the CEO founder's decision, which was horribly uh, wrong uh, and flawed. We'll say misguided. Yeah, misguided is that that person decided to shut off uh, our Facebook ads on September 1st. Mm. And while our Google ads were still going, we were getting, you know, leads in from Google and we were, you know, we were doing a pretty good job of that, like sort of within our KPI, all of a sudden everything just dried up. And we we're like, why are we getting now like 10 X more for our leads on Google than we were getting on August 31st? Like, why is this like, what the hell, like all things being equal, like what changed? And we, we all sort of came to the conclusion that, oh my God, we shut off our Facebook ads. Mm. So here we are like doing stupid stuff like that. We realized it thankfully within a very short period of time and then got things back. But what we were thinking is that, oh, well, if we're running level zero traffic, which is sort of branded, more branded ads, and then we're retargeting them or then we're targeting sort of the branded keywords like tier 11, that kind of thing. These people weren't going there. They were actually going to the non-branded search which is Facebook ad agency, that kind of thing, because they were seeing us. They might not remember the name, but they were going to Google that and like, oh, well, I sort of see their name. I think I saw that. Maybe they saw a video of me doing some kind of educational thing and then maybe a retargeting video, which is maybe a little bit shorter, like, you know, a stupid guitar video that I might do. But like, we realized like, oh my God, we're guilty of it too. And this is, you know, we were not running hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of ads, but it's exactly what you're talking about. I'm like, we're not getting anything from Facebook. Let's shut that off. And Google's going great. Let's just go over there. And all of a sudden it all fell apart. And we have since resuscitated it and everything is relatively back to normal. We're still looking at it. We're saying, all right, that was that the event. Never assume that it's, that's the thing. Could be other things as well. I said, we really need to investigate here and figure out whether or not it was the Facebook ads. But the point is, is it's a case study in what not to do but directly in proportion to exactly what you're talking about. 
Yeah. It, it, so, I mean, I'd say good on y'all for figuring it out because what I've seen is I've seen clients turn off their acquisition campaigns. You know, let's say you're spending 10 grand a month on an acquisition campaign, which brings clients in the door, but doesn't close them. And you don't realize that they're being closed elsewhere. When you shut that campaign off, your profitability goes up. You know, let's say that it feeds you for 90 days or whatever. Well, for the next 90 days, because you already have a pipeline of clients, you think you made the right decision. You're like, right. bam, we did it. We optimized. Right. Yeah, I'm spending 10 grand less. We I'm still making the same out. profitability. And then 90 days later, you have to remember, oh, yeah, we shut the thing off at the time. And 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 then now you have to know that it, it, it was 90 days on a pipeline perspective. And that's how long it takes people to convert. And for people that don't know their numbers, which is a lot, mm-hmm. they might never realize what actually killed their campaign was their over-optimization. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Because you get, you get greedy at times or you just yeah. think, you know, for us, it's, it's not necessarily a 90 day window. It was almost immediate. It was crazy how it just like, boom, it's gone. Yeah. So when I'm being hyperbolic with 90 days. It might be seven days. It might be 18 months. You know, if you're big B2B, whatever. Yeah, for sure. For sure. But if it's 90 days and you haven't figured it out because you've got that longer cycle, Right. It's harder to rectify because you don't remember what you did 90 days ago. Harder to bring it back. Well, so yeah. that's, you know, one of the other things that I've written down here is longer timelines. Longer if time you're running traffic, especially paid traffic, you know, mm-hmm. I, and, and I'm guilty of this. We tell everybody on every sales call, it takes 90 days to prove concept. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll probably still say that for smaller campaigns, but you need to be willing to invest for a longer period of time to really see not just what's going to work on the micro, but what's going to work on the macro. What's your overarching conversion lift? How many more brands, you know, uh, impressions are you getting? What's your what's the impact to your organic search? Those types of things. Um, it's no longer the turn it off, turn it on. Yeah. You know, there's the, the the faucet of traffic is no longer a good strategy. Turn it. That was on, the best analogy I could come off. up with. I like yeah. that. The faucet. The traffic faucet. The traffic faucet. Word. You know, once again, you, you, you did it. You crystallized the whole episode right there. <laughs> That's the future of traffic is the faucet. Do not turn off the faucet. Keep the faucet on. It's really is, yes. is, is it. I mean, I think you need, this is not easy to do if you are bootstrapped and you are living hand to mouth and you can barely pay your bills. Like it, like, I'm not going to kid you. This is a hard thing to do. And this is the reason why. I still do think, even though Facebook got a little bit preachy on this kind of crap at the start, it's like, you're hurting small businesses. Well, they actually are. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's larger agencies with larger spend and stuff like uh, bigger businesses. We're seeing less of an impact here overall. Plus, surprise, surprise, they all read Alex Hermosi's $100 million offers book. They've got a good offer. Right. Like, it still works no matter what. You've got a solid business. But if you're just skating by on razor thin, you know, easy for me to say, razor thin, row ass margins. It's a lot of R's alliterating. It, it, it's going to be harder for you to make this work. And I do think when we've talked about this probably a fair amount on the show is that a lot of these changes have hurt small businesses and it's hard to make this work. It's, it's easy for us to say, look at your marketing holistically. I have all your channels. Like people want to attribute stuff like, oh, do I turn, do I turn up my Google ads and I turn it down my Facebook ads? And what do I do? Do I throw in Snapchat? And then do I do this over here? Do I optimize for SEO? Well, it's all working together to acquire customers through like a larger sort of customer acquisition path. And as soon as you can sort of understand that and look at it holistically, smaller businesses are going to have a harder time doing that, especially those that are bootstrapped that might not be able to get even a level of data here because of all these changes. So I'm not like, I'm not saying like what we figured out here is the easy button by any stretch, you know, maybe the hot zap, uh, you know, Cosm Google's guru strategy. And we're just like adding words to this. The hot zap Cosm guru strategy maybe is the solution. I don't know. The point is, is like you do have to look at things in a broader way and it comes back to good marketing principles. And um, we'll continue to talk about this in future episodes for sure. But I think, you know, uh, places like Traffic and Conversion Summit are a very smart place to go so that you don't just continue to wallow and complain. You're actually out there looking for solutions. And that's, mm. that's the big, that's the big takeaway. Yeah. You're allowed to cry for a day. That's my rule. Like when something catastrophic, you know, the old Panda update that killed SEO, like I'm like, all right, I get to crawl under my desk 
and I get to sit there with a, you know, a bottle of Jack or I'm really a wine cooler kind of guy. Just to Jack to make myself <laughs> sound cool. But you know, like you get to, well, you to, did have an old to, fashioned I hear last couple. Of I had, yeah. Now. Yeah. My buddy bought me an old fashioned and I had about 50% of it before I was trying to make out with strangers. Um, <laughs> you're allowed to, you're allowed to like I've wallow for a day. And then after that, it's just like, how do we, how do we move forward and how do we fix this? Yep. And by the way, y'all, this is all fixable. I actually think and this will be in a whole new episode. I think this is good news. We're going to unseat and usurp a lot of the, the people that have held ownership over specific industries. We're going to go organic. We're going to go value provision. I, I think small businesses have a really unique opportunity now to own a space that previously they, didn't, they couldn't have owned. Uh, and big businesses don't have the ability to invest in the level of niching down that would be necessary to provide that level of, of quality content. So there's a, there's a big, big, big opportunity here. There's a lot of light at the end of this, or, you know, gold, golden pot at the end of the rainbow, light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but you can't use the old tools. You have to shed yourself of, of some of the old paradigms. And that, that was the point of this conversation. And hopefully we've got that across. And we're talking the future of traffic here. So uh, go out there and put your future goggles on and listen to this show a couple of times and go back to a few episodes that we've done, especially recently. This is the place to find what is working really now for people who are doing it. And I don't want to like toot our own horn here, but like, Listen to people who actually do know this stuff and are, are actually doing it. And, you know, do not buy that course for the guy who, you know, runs a million dollars a year in Facebook ads. We see it all the time. I mean, come on. It's ridiculous. Don't buy that crap. Like, listen and go buy. And we don't have anything to sell. I don't, I don't sell any info products, you know? So it's like I have no you know, skin in the game here. All I want is people to get a lot of value out of this show, and hopefully you have today. So, uh, Qasem Aslam, thanks for bringing it, brother. And uh, look forward to seeing you the next time when you're not virtual, perhaps, you know, in person. You could do another one of those things. A little powwow. Over, a couple, <laughs> Over <laughs> a couple of wine coolers. Over a couple of wine coolers. I can't wait. Until next week, everybody. See ya. Write us reviews.